This Parsha podcast is sponsored by my dear friends and longtime podcast listeners, Jacob and Maiden Kluger of San Antonio, in honor of their children and their parents. You too can sponsor a Parsha podcast in honor or in memory of a friend or a loved one, and you could partner with us to help us spread Torah throughout the world. Please visit our website, torchweb.org, or email me at rabbiwalby at gmail.com. Parshas Vayeshev contains a brisk 112 verses. There's two intersecting storylines. There's a story of Joseph and his relationship with his brother and eventually how he ends up in Egypt. And there's, in the middle of the Parsha, we have the story of Judah, his family, and his child that he bore with his daughter-in-law in a very unusual way. And looking at these two stories... From the big picture, we can see now that both of these stories are harbingers of the Messiah and redemption. Joseph, even though he was sold as a slave to Egypt, eventually he became king. And eventually he was there to assist the Jewish people in their formation. And ultimately his sale to Egypt brought about the formation of the Jewish nation. And Judah, even though he has quite a scandalous episode with his daughter-in-law, ultimately the children that are born from that relationship are the forbearers of Messiah. And this is one of the general themes of the Parsha, that redemption, salvation, does not appear in the expected fashion. It's only post facto, only once all the pieces have settled down, only then can we reverse engineer the episode and examine the divine hand that was manipulating and overseeing everything that happened to bring about the redemption. And the Parsha begins that Jacob settled in the land of his father's sojourns in the land of Canaan. Jacob had spent 22 years away from his father's homeland, away from the land of Canaan. He was 20 years together with Laban, plus two years traveling back and making pit stops along the way for a year and a half and a half a year. So it's been 22 years since he was living in Canaan. He's finally back and he's settling down. Rashi tells us that the fact that Jacob wanted to settle down is a little bit of a problem because he's, after all, a tzaddik, he's righteous. And righteous people are never supposed to be complacent. They're never supposed to feel like they have overcome their obstacles. They have accomplished whatever it is that whatever it is that they need to do, and now they can relax. Says Rashi, the Almighty says, Jacob, you want to live in peace and serenity and tranquility? No. In Olam Abba, in the spiritual world, in the next world, in the afterlife, that is when the righteous have peace of mind and can settle down. But if you desire to have peace of mind, and to settle down over here? No, that's improper. And therefore, as a result of that, the episode of Joseph and the chaos that that engendered in Jacob's life was sprung upon him. And I think, you know, if we look back at Jacob's life, his desire to settle down is quite understandable. His life has been a nonstop litany of upheavals. His brother wants to kill him and he has to escape to Laban. And of course, that's not a place of refuge because Laban is deceiving him and tricking him at every turn. He works for seven years to marry Rachel and Laban supplies Leah. To have Rachel, Jacob needs to work for another seven years. After 14 years of work, Jacob is moved to a salary employee of Laban. But over the course of the next six years, Laban changes the terms of his salary a hundred times, roughly once every three weeks. After 20 years with Laban, Jacob realizes that his father-in-law would take his family away and he has to flee. And when he flees back, Esau wants to kill him with 400 men. And as he gets closer to where Isaac lived, his daughter Dina is kidnapped and and assaulted. And he has to flee the region of Shechem because his sons decimate an entire city. Of course, this storyline would compel anyone to seek a little bit of 
peace to settle down. And here we see a theme that we've seen several times throughout Genesis, that the Almighty treats the righteous very differently than he treats everyone else. The more righteous someone is, the greater divine scrutiny is given to even their most slightest of missteps. In God's eyes, Jacob is someone that should never take the foot off the gas. If you're in this world, if the Almighty gives you life, you have to constantly be striving to improve and don't try to cash in in the serenity and the tranquility and the peace that is designated for the next world. The next world is a time for consumption. So long as you're here, the Almighty tells, the Almighty tells Jacob, you're here to work and not to relax. And right away, things start heading south. Joseph, Jacob's favorite son, the son that he would study with the most, the son that even looked the most similar to Jacob, the eldest son of Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel, Joseph starts behaving in a way that's a little bit problematic. He's young, and he likes to play with his hair, and he likes to beautify his eyes, and he's a little childish, a little juvenile, and he also incites his brothers against him. Jacob had four wives, two primary wives and two secondary wives, and Joseph was involved in causing all kinds of friction between the brothers. He would bring the reports back to his father. He would give his father evil reports against his brothers. The brothers are sinners, he would tell Jacob. They ate a limb from a living animal. They belittled the sons of the maidservants, the four sons of Billa and Zilpah. They would call them slaves. They're guilty of sexual misconduct. And he would be a snitch. And of course, that that irritated the brothers. But in addition, because Jacob had such a love and a favoritism even for Joseph, he went out of his way to show that to him. And he even made this special woolen tunic that he gave to Joseph and Joseph alone. And that was an object of their brother's disdain for Joseph. The brothers saw that it was he whom their father loved most of all his brothers. So they hated him and they could not speak to him peaceably. The commentaries have a discussion. Did Jacob make a mistake by showing favoritism to Joseph over the rest of his brothers? This is an interesting question. You know, as parents, we have to show love to our children, but maybe it's a problem if we favor one child over the other child because that could create enmity between the two children. Some of the commentaries seem to find a mistake in Jacob's practices. Others say, no, he didn't make a mistake. But regardless, even if he did make a mistake, he was gravely punished for him. And I think it's also interesting, if we look a little bit later on, at the end of Genesis, we see interactions that Jacob has with Joseph after this whole imbroglio of the brothers selling Joseph as a slave, as will happen in this week's Parsha. When Jacob after this event has happened, when he has to interact with his sons, he does not show favoritism to Joseph. So I think regardless of how we see this initial treatment of Joseph vis-a-vis the rest of the brothers, what is clear is that Jacob learned his lesson later on in the Torah. When Jacob has to relate to Joseph, he does not show him any favoritism. He treats him like everyone else. The brothers are rankled by Joseph, and they cannot speak favorably of him. They don't speak about him peaceably. Rashi points out that this is an indirect compliment of the brothers. They were not two-faced. They were very direct in their hatred, in their animosity towards Joseph, and they weren't They didn't treat him with a pleasant smile to his face and speak negatively behind his back. They were the same in their heart as they were in their mouth. There was no discrepancy between how they really felt towards him and how they treated him, which is a compliment that they weren't two-faced. But all this comes to a head when Joseph has a series of dreams. In the first dream, he sees him and his brothers and they're bundling bundles of wheat in the field. And he tells this dream to his brothers that 
his bundle arose and stood erect, and your bundles, the sheaves that you had gathered, they bowed down before me. Joseph is implying with this first dream that Joseph is going to stand up tall. He's going to be like a king. And the brothers are going to bow down before him. They're going to submit themselves to him, that he's going to lord over them. And this only increases the disdain that the brothers have for him. Are you going to be a king over us? Are you going to dominate us? And they hated him even more because of his dreams and because of his talk. And then Joseph had a second dream. In this dream, it wasn't Joseph's bundles versus the bundles of the brothers. It was Joseph himself. And there were 11 stars representing his 11 brothers, the sun representing his father, and the moon representing his mother. And they were all bowing down to him. He tell, he tells over this dream to his father and his brothers, and his father scolds him and says, is this a real dream? After all, didn't your mother, Rachel, already pass away in last week's parsha? It's not possible that the moon, meaning your mother, will come bow down before you because after all, she has passed. And therefore, the dream is nonsensical. Yet, the brothers were envious of him, they were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Jacob, as a skillful parent, recognized that these dreams, which could be interpreted as megalomaniacal, Joseph has these visions of grandeur, of monarchy, of lording over his brothers. This could cause tension and hatred between the brothers. And therefore, even though Jacob secretly believed that this indeed was likely to happen or that there was some element of truth in what the dream is foreshadowing, that the dream indeed is a portent to future events. Still, publicly, when the brothers were there, he disregarded it so that they should not hate him for it, so that he would keep the tensions at bay. And as we've mentioned previously, every time in the Torah that there is a dream, it is indeed prophetic. The Talmud in the Book of Brachos tells us that even today, when we have dreams, there is a small element of truth in those dreams, a small element of prophecy in the dreams, even though the majority of the dream can be nonsensical. Joseph has a dream, and the dream indeed is portending to events that are going to happen in next week's parsha. Joseph will become a king, and the brothers will bow down before him. As a general rule, the proportion of reality that is going to be conveyed to us in our dreams are the same proportion of how much, of how spiritually inclined we are during the day. The more someone's evolved with Torah and truth, the more truthful their dreams are. So for example, my grandfather told over the story that in the yeshiva that existed in Lomja in Poland, There was a major fight that broke out, and it even resulted in fistfights in the base madrash in the House of Scholarship. And in in middle of the whole fight, the Chafetz Chaim, who who was the greatest sage of the time, arrives into the door and clarifies the matter and settles the dispute. And the question was asked to him, how did the Chafetz Chaim, who was in Radin, far away, how did he know that there was some sort of huge dispute going on in Lomja at the time that he arrived just in the nick of time to settle the matters. And he told them that his son-in-law had a dream that there was a fire in Lomja. And right away, the Chafetz Chaim understood that there was something going on in the yeshiva. And quickly, he headed out towards the yeshiva to go settle the matter. Rabbi Tzadok Kakan, one of the Hasidic giants of the 19th century, actually wrote a book containing all of his insights in all of the parts of the Talmud that he came up with in the middle of his dreams. And here we see that Joseph has dreams, and they too really are prophetic, but his brothers, they say, no, 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 these dreams are not prophetic. Rather, they're just the fantasies of his immature mind, and it's improper to record them any seriousness. 
Now, it's interesting, the, the, the word that the Torah uses to describe Jacob anticipating the matter is Aviv Shamar et Hadavar. He guarded it, meaning he anticipated the opportunity to fulfill it. In the Torah, the term that we use for observing the Torah, observing the mitzvot, is to guard or shomer, to shamar, to, to guard the matter. And here we see a definition of guarding the matter means to anticipate and await the opportunity to fulfill it. When we talk about observing the Torah, what it means is not only to observe it when it's feasible, but also to anticipate and await the time to fulfill it when it's not. The proper way to study Torah is to study it always with the intention of trying to fulfill it should the opportunity arise. My grandfather used to give an example. There was a man who was studying the portion of the Talmud which lauds someone who loans a poor person in their time of of grave need. So this man is studying the Talmud and he's getting all into the matter and then he he hears a knock on the door and and there's a poor person at the door and he asks for a, a loan to help him in his time of need. So right away, the homeowner says, well, I don't know, come back later, I got to talk to my wife, I don't have time right now, come to my office, and he sends the man packing. And right away, he goes back to the Talmud and studies it intensely. And this is an example of someone who the study was not done with anticipation of fulfilling it. The proper way to study is to make it real, to have the matter penetrate your heart, and not to allow it to go in one ear out the other, but not affect your behavior. And it happened one time where the brothers of Joseph had taken their father's flock to pasture in the city of Shechem, the city we saw last week, a place that is designated for bad things to happen. And Jacob tells Joseph, why don't you go visit your brothers, check out, find out how they're doing with the pasture in Shechem. And Joseph agreed readily. And Jacob sent him from the depth of Hebron, and he arrived in Shechem. Rashi tells us that Hebron is actually not a valley, even though it says the depth of Hebron. It's the it's actually a mountain. Rather, what the verse is referring to, that there's something very deep going on over here. And Rashi invokes the covenant between the parts that happened in chapter 15 of Genesis, where God told Abraham, You should know surely that your descendants will be foreigners in a foreign land. They'll be enslaved for 400 years. And the deep planning is now being brought to fruition where Joseph is going to end up in Egypt. And eventually the whole family will end up there and the whole nation will be there. And the depth of Hebron refers to the deep planning to fulfill the promise that God made to Abraham, who is buried in Hebron. And Joseph is looking for his brothers, and a man sees him. Rashi tells us that this man is the angel Gabriel, who was trying to send a message to Joseph to intercede, that he he should realize that the brothers uh, have very nefarious plans with him. The man asked him, well, what are you looking for? I'm looking for my brothers. Where are they? The man says to them, they have journeyed on from here, implying that they are no longer viewing you with the love of brotherhood and kinship. I heard them say, that, let's go to Dosan. So Joseph is, finds them in, in Dosan. Rashi points out that they're really looking for a pretext to kill you. And the man, the angel, is trying to hint to Joseph that it's quite dangerous for you to go visit your brothers. Joseph goes, nonetheless... They see him from afar, and when he had not yet approached them, they conspire to kill him. They said, look, there's the dreamer. Joseph is coming. Let's come and kill him and throw him into one of the pits, and then we'll say a wild beast devoured him, and we'll see what will happen with his dreams. The brothers are now scheming to kill Joseph. And they had a rationale for that. Just like last week we saw how Shimon and Levi, they had some justification for their decision to decimate the entire city of Shechem. Here too, this plot to kill Joseph was not without its justification and rationale. And they theorized, Joseph is sending all these bad reports to Jacob about us. 
And you remember what happened last time Jacob cursed someone? He cursed Rachel, and Rachel died as a result of Jacob's curse. The brothers are quite scared of Jacob's curses. What's going to be when Joseph conveys a false report to Jacob? Jacob curses us as a result. We're all going to die. Ergo, Joseph is trying to kill us. And the law is that if someone's trying to kill you, you kill them first. They are what's called a halachic pursuer. Joseph is pursuing us, trying to kill us. Therefore, we have to kill him before he kills us. That was their calculation. We're going to kill him and throw him into the pit and tell Jacob that he was killed by some rogue animal. And then we shall see what will become of his dreams. Rashi tells us that this last line of verse 20 is actually God speaking. It wasn't the brother speaking sardonically. Then we'll see what will happen with his dreams. Rather, it's the Almighty speaking. You think you could stop the plan that I've put in place? No. We will indeed see how his dreams will be borne out. This is, of course, a very unlikely path for how the Jews are going to end up in Egypt and ultimately proliferate into an entire nation. The brothers, they're scheming to kill Joseph, but God is saying we will see indeed what's going to happen with his dreams. Reuben hears this and he rescues them. And he says, no, 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 we can't kill him mortally, shed no blood, throw him into this pit, into the wilderness, but don't touch him with your hand. And Reuben was intending to rescue him from their hand to return him to his father. So they listened to Reuben. Joseph arrived. They stripped him of his tunic. According to the Midras, they stripped him of all his clothing and they threw him into the pit. The pit was empty. There's no water in it. Rashi tells us there's no water in it, but there are snakes and scorpions in it. And this is kind of interesting. Reuben is trying to save Joseph. We shouldn't shed his blood. We shouldn't lay a hand on him. Instead, we should throw him into the pit. Well, what's in the pit? There ain't no water. You know what there is in there? There is snakes and scorpions. It seems kind of odd. If Reuben's trying to save Joseph, why why doesn't he actually save them? In addition, if the brothers are trying to kill Joseph and they feel like they're justified in trying to kill him, well, then why do they agree to Reuben's plan to throw him into the pit? So there's a very famous teaching here from the Or HaChaim, one of the commentators on the Torah. He explains that Reuben was arguing to the brothers, listen, you think that Joseph is guilty of a capital offense and therefore we have to kill him. He's a pursuer. He's trying to kill us and therefore we have to kill him first. You know what? Maybe you're right, but maybe you're wrong. And what's going to be if we decide to kill him, if we ourselves choose to kill him, It's possible that Joseph is really innocent. But because we are taking this drastic step of killing him, we're going to kill him even though he's innocent. We have free will. Our free will can even effectuate the death of someone else, someone else who is really innocent. However, if we throw him into the pit, in the pit there are scorpions and snakes. If the scorpions and snakes who don't have free will, if they kill him, then it is indeed evidence that he is guilty. And therefore, we can use this proxy as a way to verify his guilt and or innocence. We'll throw him into the pit. And if he's guilty, he's going to be killed by the snakes or the scorpions. If he's innocent, he is going to survive, which is a very interesting and actually quite controversial opinion here that there has to be some point where we have free will. And then there's another point where God makes a decision. Because if we have free will, well, we make the decisions. And if God has the choice, then he makes the decisions. And therefore, there has to be some arena in where humans have a say. And there's other arenas where God has the say. And here, what the Orachim says, and of course, this is not something which is universally agreed upon. What he says is that even with respect to killing another person, free will reigns. It's possible for someone to commit homicide, kill another person. That person in God's eyes is innocent, but God gives man the free will to make these choices. Reuben tries to save him 
And he does that by throw, by convincing them to throw him into the pit, into the wilderness. And that's indeed what happened. They throw him into the pit. The pit is empty. There's no water. But Joseph survives, even though there are snakes and scorpions in it. The Midrash tells us that Reuben, even though he was intending to try to save Joseph, he didn't do a complete job. He should have placed Joseph on his shoulders told the brothers, if you want to kill Joseph, you have to kill me first and marched him out of there to his father. Reuben made a misstep by not completing what he had started. He had began in the effort of trying to save Joseph and he stopped before Joseph was totally saved. Meanwhile, Joseph is in the pit and the brothers are there near the pit and they see a caravan of Ishmaelites of Arab merchants traveling on their way to Egypt. Their camels are contain all these spices, balsam, lotus. And Judah pipes up. And Judah says, are we really going to kill our brother and cover up his blood? I have a better solution. Instead of allowing Joseph to be killed in the pit, let's sell him as a slave to the Ishmaelites. Let our hands not be guilty of killing him. After all, he's our brother. He's our own flesh. And the brothers agreed. They sold Joseph as a slave in exchange for 20 pieces of silver to the Ishmaelites. The Ishmaelites eventually sold him again and he was sold again. And eventually Joseph is sold to Egypt. Sometime later, Reuben returns to the pit. He had come back to rescue Joseph and he finds that the pit is empty. Joseph is not there and he realizes that something really terrible has happened. The brothers take Joseph's tunic. They slaughter a goat. Rashi tells us the goat has blood which is similar to the blood of a human. They dip the tunic in the blood and they send it to their father, to Jacob. We found this, they tell him. Identify, if you please, is this your son's tunic or not? Jacob recognized it He says, my son's tunic, a savage beast devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to bits. Jacob tears his garments in mourning. He sits in sackcloth and he is totally inconsolable. No matter what his children try to do to brighten Jacob's mood, he mourns incessantly. His father bewails him and eventually the chapter ends where Joseph is sold to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's ministers, the chamberlain of the butchers in Egypt. So there's a few things to point out in this episode. The first unusual matter here is that the Torah tells us that the caravan of Ishmaelites were carrying spices, balsam, and lotus. This seems like a very trivial bit of information that the Torah finds it necessary to tell us the cargo of the caravan that bought Joseph as a slave. Rashi tells us something quite surprising. Why did the verse, why did scripture tell us the cargo of the caravan that carried Joseph? To tell us the reward of the righteous. Because normally the Arab merchants, all they carry is foul-smelling items And here we see that they're carrying spices. And this shows us the reward of the righteous, meaning the reward of Joseph, that he should not have the unpleasant smell when he descends to Egypt. And this is, of course, very surprising. Joseph was just betrayed by his own flesh and blood. His own family members sold him as a slave. He's heading out to the unknown, He was not treated like a Jewish slave. I'm sure he wasn't given the pillow and a blanket. He was treated probably very harshly. And here Rashi tells us that this is reward for the righteous, that they get to smell the wonderful perfume on the way down to Egypt. If you were to ask Joseph, I'm sure he wouldn't be thinking at all about what it smells like. He must be terrified. He must be humiliated. He must feel betrayed that his his own brother sold him as a slave? What is the meaning behind this idea that the Torah highlights 
the pleasant smells that Joseph was able to enjoy on his way down as a slave in shackles to Egypt. So I think there's maybe two ways to understand this. First of all, it's a lesson in understanding suffering. We believe when someone suffers, it is from God, it is purposeful, and the exact amount of suffering is taken into account by God. Of course, what the caravan smelled like was very, very low on the matters that Joseph was concerned with when he was sold as a slave to Egypt. Of course. But Joseph did not need to have that level of suffering. The the small iota, which was the bad smell, Joseph didn't need to have, and therefore he didn't have it. For whatever reason, the Almighty decided that Joseph needed to suffer, but he didn't suffer a single smidgen more than what was exactly perfectly measured by God, which was necessary. And I think maybe there's another way to look at it, uh, especially in light of the greater theme of the Parsha, that the Almighty is orchestrating Joseph's ascent to kingdom in Egypt. In God's eyes, God knows how this is all going to play out. This is all part of the prophecy that Joseph was shown in his dream that he's, he's going to be a king and his brother's going to bow down to him. He doesn't know it at the time, but God does. And therefore, the Almighty is showing us and showing maybe Joseph, maybe he could figure this out post facto, that such cargo is not indeed appropriate for such a trip. He doesn't know it, and it won't be recognized for many years, but in God's view, this trip that Joseph is taking down to Egypt is in effect Joseph's triumphant cavalcade of a king down to Egypt. And therefore, it's quite appropriate that it should be smelling like perfume. Now, after the brothers sell Joseph, Reuben returns to the pit and he finds it empty. Well, where was Reuben at the time of the sale? Rashi gives us two answers. Either that the brothers had a rotation of who was in charge of tending to Jacob. And now it was Reuben's turn and therefore he left. The brothers went back to his father. That's one opinion. Alternatively, Reuben was amidst his prayer, his repentance, and his fasting for the activity that he did last week in the Parsha, where he swapped his father's bed from the tent of Bila to the tent of his mother, Leah. This is really interesting that amid the deliberations over killing his brother, the brothers are discussing to do something so unimaginable. They're going to kill Joseph. And Reuben intervenes. And he says, no, 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 don't kill him. Throw him into the pit. And in the middle of all that, Reuben says, okay, it's time for me to leave. And he seems to have trusted that the brothers won't do anything too harsh. And indeed, he was wrong. He came back and the pit was empty. But it's just an interesting thing that in Reuben's eyes, these activities, either to go tend to his father or to go partake in his fasting and repentance for his mis- misdeed of last week's parasha, those were so important that he even was willing to leave the scene of the crime, uh, the scene of Joseph, and go partake in that before fully extracting Joseph from his danger. The brothers slaughter a goat for its blood, and they dip the tunic in it, and they try to use that to assuage Jacob's pain by being convinced that his son is dead, he'll be consoled, he can move on from it. And this is uh, another pattern that we see that Jacob is being deceived, uh, first by Laban, now by his son, which is perhaps noteworthy. And he announces that a wild beast has devoured Joseph. It seems like Jacob thought that indeed a wild animal had killed Joseph. And it seems like if we were to read this verse without looking at Rashi, it seems like Jacob's diagnosis was totally wrong. No, there was no animal that had devoured Joseph. Joseph is still alive. He's being duped into thinking that an animal had devoured Joseph. But in reality, Joseph was was okay. Maybe he was in a bad condition, but he was okay. Rashi says something really interesting. Jacob had a flash of prophecy 
There was indeed a wild beast about to devour Joseph, not an actual wild animal, but very soon Joseph is going to have to contend with the seductions of the wife of Potiphar, of his master's wife, which is going to try to devour him spiritually like a wild beast. Jacob is sure that his son is gone, and no one tells him otherwise. And indeed, for the next 22 years, the exact number of years that Jacob was away from his father, Joseph is going to be away from his father, Jacob. For the next 22 years, Jacob will be in the dark. The sons of Jacob know. The Almighty, of course, knows. Jacob's father, Isaac, which who is still alive, he also knows that Joseph is alive, but no one tells Jacob. The brothers, of course, don't tell Jacob for obvious reasons. He would be very disappointed if he finds out that his own sons sold Joseph as a slave. Isaac doesn't tell Jacob because God doesn't tell Jacob. Well, why does God not tell Jacob? So maybe there's a few answers to that question. Rashi tells us that the brothers made a ban, an edict against telling Jacob. They were going to curse whoever went against this blood pact. And they included God in that ban. And God indeed obeyed, and he didn't reveal it to Jacob. This is kind of interesting. Maybe this is another instance where free will is going to override divine decree. The other commentaries tell us that all this needed to happen in order to facilitate the completion of God's master plan to pivot the people to Egypt and fulfill the promise to Abraham at the covenant of the parts that his children will be foreigners in a foreign land. Had Jacob known that Joseph was sold as a slave to Egypt, he would have turned over the world to go rescue him, and then all the future events could not have happened. And therefore, the money did not reveal it because that would have disrupted the grand plan of getting the Jews down to Egypt. All this pain that Jacob suffers. He's totally inconsolable. For 22 years, he is despondent. He's depressed. He doesn't have prophecy. All that could have indeed been avoided, but it was crucial to be able to go ahead with the steps needed to send the family of Jacob and eventually to found the nation in the land of Egypt. Chapter 38 takes a break from the story and the narrative about Joseph and tells us what happened to Judah after this event. And it was at that time that Judah went down from his brothers. Judah was demoted after the brothers had seen how terribly Jacob had taken the episode of Joseph. They blamed Judah. You told us to sell him. Had you told us to return him to our father, we would have listened to you. And therefore his stature was reduced. He was demoted in the eyes of his brother. And he went and he got married and he had three sons, Er, Onan, and Shelah. And Judah took a wife for Er, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. And this chapter, I think, is a good example of the Torah not being strictly chronological. Of course, Judah getting married, having three children, having his children be old enough to get married, that, of course, is a story of multiple decades, and it intersects in the narrative of Joseph being sold and Joseph arriving in Egypt and what happens to him there. So obviously, it's not chronological. So Judah's eldest son, Er, is married to Tamar, but he was evil in the eyes of God and God caused him to die. Why was he evil? Because he refused to procreate with his wife Tamar. He would deliberately spill his seed outside of her Tamar was very beautiful, and he was worried if she would become pregnant, it would diminish her beauty, and therefore he deliberately avoided procreation, and that was evil in the eyes of God, and he died. And then Judah says to his next son, Onan, well, your brother died without any children. It's now appropriate for you in a precursor to what became known as Yibum, leverate marriages, where a brother dies without children and his brother will marry the widow of the deceased brother, 
Go marry her, Judah tells Onan, and establish offspring for your brother. But Onan, he too let his seed go to waste on the ground and refused to procreate with his wife, the woman who used to be his sister-in-law, Tamar. And therefore he too was evil in the eyes of Hashem and he too died. So Judah has a daughter-in-law, Tamar, and two dead sons, Aaron and Onan. And now Tamar wants to continue. Well, there's a third son, Shelah. Maybe she can marry him. But in Judah's eyes, this woman is a problem. She's killing all his sons. And she, so therefore he deflects her. He says, you know, you, my son Shayla is kind of young. Why don't you wait till he grows up and then I'll give you him to marry? But really that was just an excuse to get rid of her. So he didn't want to allow his third son Shayla to marry Tamar. In his view, he attributed the death of his sons to their common wife, Tamar, when in reality it was their own sins that contributed to their early demise. Sometime later, Judah's own wife dies, and our sages find in this death of Judah's wife a little bit of measure for measure, tit for tat, for Judah's own behavior. The Midrash tells us, whoever begins doing a mitzvah, but does not complete it, but does not finish it, they will bury their wife and their sons. Judah began a mitzvah of saving Joseph. He said to them, don't kill him, save him, sell him as a slave, but he didn't complete it. He didn't actually return Joseph to Jacob, and therefore his wife and his sons had to die. And this is measure for measure. Why? When someone starts something but doesn't complete it, then the appropriate punishment is that they should start something else and not be allowed to see it come to fruition. Judah started saving Joseph but didn't finish it. Therefore, God says, you'll start building a family, but you won't get to finish it because your wife and your children will die. And after Judah's wife dies, Tamar, his daughter-in-law, she realizes that this was all a ruse. She's not going to be allowed to marry Shayla. And she's very desirous of having children from the, from the family of Judah and from the family of Jacob. So she takes off her widow's garb. She dresses up as a prostitute. And she sits by the crossroads waiting for Judah to arrive. Judah sees her. He thinks she's a harlot. She covers her face. And they start negotiating on a price for her services. And Judah tells her, okay, I'll give you an animal if you sleep with me. But I don't have an animal with me. You have to trust me. I'll pay you later. She says, sure, but provided that you give me some sort of collateral to ensure that you will actually pay. And Judah gives her his signet ring, the garment that he would use to wrap himself, and the staff. In effect, Judah gave his daughter-in-law that he didn't realize was his daughter-in-law, he gave her three items that were easily identifiable with him. They consorted together. She became pregnant. She left. She went back and got dressed up as a widow again, and Judah went along his way. Now, Judah wants to recoup his collateral, so he sends one of his people to go give an animal to this prostitute, and they don't find her. And no one seems to know of anyone fitting that description. And Judah's man returns to him empty-handed. There's a woman out there whom Judah spent time with, who now has three identifying items to show that she had this relationship with them. And three months later, And Judah gets a message, your daughter-in-law, Tamar, who's really supposed to be waiting to marry your son, Shayla, she must have committed harlotry. She's pregnant after all. It's three months have passed, and now she's showing. And Judah says, Judah was, I guess, the religious leader of the locale. And he says, take her out and let her be burned. That is what is done to women who behave in such a manner, or at least that's what was done at the time, let her be burned. And as she was taken out, she sends a message to to her father-in-law. She sends those three items. 
And she tells him, by the man to whom these belong, that is the father of the child. Identify, if you please, whose are these signet, this wrap, and this staff. Judah recognized, he says, she is right. It is from me. I didn't give her my daughter Shayla, and therefore she took this drastic action. So a few things over here. First of all, Judah, he was the one who killed the goat to dip Joseph's tunic into it to deceive his father. And here, he's supposed to send a goat to Tamar, to this prostitute, the person he thought was a prostitute, as payment, and he is deceived with a goat, measure for measure for his deception with a goat. And after Tamar is accused of committing a capital offense, why was it considered a capital offense as discussed by the commentaries? Interestingly, the Baal Haturim tells us that no, they weren't going to burn her and kill her. They were going to brand her as a prostitute for her action, but they weren't going to kill her. But regardless, after she's accused, she doesn't announce to everyone that, oh, it's my father-in-law Judah. He's the one who's really the co-conspirator in this crime. She throws the ball to his court. She says, I'm going to give you the choice. Either you're going to admit publicly and shame yourself, or you could kill me if you want. That's your choice, says the Talmud. From here, we see a very important lesson. To embarrass someone publicly is something very severe. Their face becomes white. The blood is drained from them. And that is equivalent to killing them on a certain degree. And therefore, it's preferable for a person to let themselves die and not whiten the face of their fellow publicly. Tamar, she could have very easily exonerated herself by announcing to all Judah is the father, but she didn't do that. She said, I'm not going to embarrass you publicly, even if that means I'm going to die. Judah displays a certain resoluteness of character. He admitted that she was right. He was wrong. She became pregnant from me and she was exonerated. In effect, the Leverite marriage that was supposed to be done by the third brother was fulfilled by the father, by Judah. He contributed towards finding a legacy for his two deceased sons with his daughter-in-law, Tamar. And sometime later came to pass that she's about to give birth, and it's twins. And something interesting happens. One baby comes out first. They assume it's the firstborn. They wrap a string around his hand, but he goes back inside and the next baby is born, Parrots. And after the second baby, Parrots, is born, the first brother that made the pump fake, the one who has a crimson thread on his hand, he is born and his name is Zerach. The Ramban, in his commentary, says something very fascinating. He says that there is a secret of leverate marriage, again, the marriage of a widow to try to establish a legacy for her deceased husband, what happens in that transaction is that the soul of the deceased husband returns to the child born from his wife. Tamar, she has two deceased husbands, the two eldest sons of Judah, Er and Onan, and therefore there's two souls that need to be perpetuated via the Leverate marriage done by Judah, and therefore she has twins. One of those children has the soul of Er, and one of those children has the son of Onan, and they are able to maintain a certain legacy through this Leverite marriage. Uh, This story is actually telling us the origins of of King David, and by extension, the origins of the Jewish monarchy and of the Messiah. And this is another theme that we see throughout the whole Parsha, that redemption, salvation, the stories of the greatest heroes and saviors of our people are not necessarily scandal-free, quite the contrary. They are very much replete with scandal.
Coincidentally, there's another story, a second story of the founding of the Jewish monarchy that has an instance of levirate marriage, and that's with the episode of Ruth and Boaz, the great-grandparents of King David. Ruth also has her husband die, and Boaz performs levirate marriage as well. It seems like what's being hinted over here is that there's something about levirate marriage, there's something about someone doing an act to perpetuate the life of a deceived relative that has the qualities and characteristics needed to be a king and to be a monarch. Thus concludes chapter 38, and we go on back to the story of Joseph in chapter 39. He is brought down to Egypt. He is sold to Potiphar. And even though he's a slave, he quickly rises to the top. He becomes successful, and he becomes the right-hand man of his Egyptian master of Potiphar. Everything that he touches, he succeeds. Everyone who sees him loves him. He's appointed as the head of the household. Everything in the estate of Potiphar goes through Joseph. There's only one part of Potiphar's life that's untouchable to Joseph, That is the bread of his master, a euphemism for his wife. Everything else under Potiphar's domain is given directly to Joseph. Joseph was handsome of form, handsome of appearance, beloved by all, admired by everyone who saw him, including his master's wife, Potiphar's wife. She looks at him and she says to him, she is entranced by him, and she wants to seduce him to sin with him. Joseph adamantly refused. It's so wrong. My master Potiphar gives me everything, everything besides for you. How can I sin against my master? How can I sin against God if I capitulate to you? There's a very interesting Rashi at the beginning of this story, which tells us that there is a certain juxtaposition between the episode of Tamar and the episode of the wife of Potiphar. Tamar was very desirous to be a mother in the house of Judah, in the family of the monarchy. And therefore, she took very drastic measures to be able to have a child from Judah. And her motivation was righteous. She really wanted to play a part in the development of the Jewish people. Similarly, says Rashi, The wife of Potiphar also intended righteously. She also wanted to play a part in the founding of the Jewish nation. And in fact, she even saw via some sort of fortune telling or astrology that she she would have children from Joseph. And therefore, she too was desirous of having children with Joseph. And that's why she tried to seduce him. Now, in the end, Joseph is going to marry her daughter and have children with her daughter. So she was correct that she'll have offspring with Joseph, but not with her directly, but rather with her daughter. And this is really interesting. We have, on one hand, Tamar, a great heroine of Jewish history, and she's acting for the sake of heaven to try to build the Jewish people with her actions. And here we have the wife of Potiphar, She too seems like she's acting for the sake of heaven, yet in Jacob's unwitting prophecy, she's a wild beast. And she causes tremendous pain to Joseph when he refuses her seductions. Yet we see that it's possible for someone to have righteous intentions, but to behave in a terrible, horrific, cruel, and evil manner. As they say, the road to hell is paved with righteous intentions. Her intentions were noble. Her actions were deplorable. And it was. She tries to convince and coax Joseph to sin. And every day he refuses to lie beside her. He refuses to be with her. Rashi says he refuses to be with her in this world. He refuses to be with her in the next world. As we've seen earlier in Genesis, the bind 
of matrimony is not only a bind in this world, it's a bind for eternity. Joseph is not willing to be bound with the wife of Potiphar for eternity. But there was one day that they were alone in the house. There was no one from the household staff with them. And she grabs onto his garment and she says, lie with me, be with me. And in his efforts to escape, she grabs his clothing, she pulls off his clothing, and he's fleeing outside, and he no longer has his clothing with him. And she sees what's happened. She's holding his garment as he's fleeing, and she starts screaming, look, this Hebrew man, he came and he's behaving in such a terrible way. He came to lie with me, and he pulled off his clothing, but I called out in a loud scream, and when he heard that I had raised my voice and screamed, he fled and left his garment with me. She turns the whole story upside down. It's not that she is seducing Joseph, it's the other way around, and she starts perpetuating this lie that it was Joseph who attacked her, not vice versa. Potiphar hears his wife's words, and he gets angry, and he takes Joseph, puts him in prison, in the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and Joseph remained in prison. Why did Potiphar not execute Joseph? After all, in those times, slaves and even ordinary citizens were executed for much more minor sins than adultery. So one of the commentaries tells us, the Sephora tells us that really Potiphar believed in Joseph's innocence, but he only imprisoned him to accord honor to his wife. Joseph was sold as a slave, and then he rose to the top, but now once again he is languishing in prison all the way back down to the bottom. Yet even in prison, he starts rising the ranks. He's charismatic, he's beloved, the prison warden gives him lots of latitude, gives him responsibility, all the inmates in the prison are under Joseph's charge. Everything that he does, he's successful. Whatever Joseph did, he flourished. Again, Joseph is being punished. He has to suffer, even though he's innocent, he was indeed someone who did the right thing. He was resistant to sin. In fact, the Talmud says that when someone who is a sinner is brought before God and God asks the sinner, why did you not study Torah? Why didn't you act properly in your lifetime? The sinner is going to tell God, well, I was so busy because I had such a strong desire to sin, I couldn't have studied. I was so beautiful, I was so handsome, I was so enamored with my own beauty, that it just totally took over my life and I just lived a life of sin. God is going to respond to such a person. Are you more beautiful than Joseph? Every single day, he was harassed and seduced by the wife of Potiphar. Every day, she would switch clothing for him. By day and by night, she would never wear the same clothing. She's constantly trying to seduce him and he did not yield And therefore, Joseph is going to obligate all the sinners. All the sinners will not have an excuse because compared to Joseph, their test is more minor. And therefore, if Joseph was able to overcome, that shows that it's possible to overcome such situations. Joseph is the paradigm of resistance to sin. And what does he have to show for it? He's once again languishing in prison. And again, at that time, if we just freeze it in place, it seems like Joseph is just being battered again and again. All the terrible things that could possibly go wrong, go wrong with him. But after the story is over, we see how the Almighty is actually orchestrating his ascent to the throne. Chapter 40 begins with another crime that resulted in imprisonment, where the baker And the cupbearer of the king of Pharaoh, they sin against Pharaoh, and they too are thrown into prison, and they become cellmates with Joseph. Rashi tells us that this is an example of the Almighty intervening to save the honor of the righteous. 
as you may imagine, when Joseph was imprisoned, there was a huge scandal. There's this slave, and he's trying to seduce this very important noble woman, and he's thrown into prison. And that was, of course, going across all of Egypt. Everyone was talking about that story. And therefore, the Almighty threw a wrench into the news cycle. He created a different scandal to diffuse the attention given to Joseph's alleged misconduct and make people talk about something else, let them focus on the next item in the list and forget about what happened previously. So now we're following three people in prison. There's Joseph, and then there's the cupbearer and the baker. And one night, they each have a dream. Each one of them has a dream, and they also have the interpretation of the other guy's dream. And in the morning, Joseph sees his two cellmates, the cupbearer and the baker, they're, they're, they're depressed, they're sad, they're confused. And he asks them, well, why, why are you so downcast today? And they both tell him that we, we had this dream and we have no way to understand what the message is. And Joseph tells them, why don't you share your dream with me? After all, the interpretations of dreams are in the eyes of God, but maybe I can help you decipher what the message is. So the cupbearer tells Joseph the dream. In the dream, there was a grapevine in front of me. There were three tendrils on on the grapevine, and it blossomed, and the clusters are ripening into grapes, and Pharaoh's cup is in my hand. I take the grapes, I squeeze them into the cup, and I place the cup on Pharaoh's palm. So Joseph tells him, I'll tell you what the interpretation of the dream is. The three tendrils are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will restore you to your post. Pharaoh will remember you and you will be brought back to service of Pharaoh. Once again, you will be placing Pharaoh's cup in his hand. And do me a favor. Don't forget about me. Mention me to Pharaoh. Maybe Pharaoh will grant me a reprieve. Maybe Pharaoh will commute my sentence. I did nothing wrong. And maybe he'll take me out of this prison, out of this dungeon. Now, meanwhile, the baker, he hears this interpretation and he realizes that this must be true because the baker was given his dream plus the interpretation of the cupbearer's dream and vice versa. And he therefore knew that Joseph's interpretation was accurate. So he tells him, well, I also had a dream. In my dream, there were three wicker baskets on my head. And on the top basket, there were all kinds of food, all kinds of baked goods, and there are birds pecking away from the food in the basket above my head. So Joseph tells him, I'll give you your interpretation. You might not be as happy with it as the one of the cupbearer. Those three baskets, they too represent three days. In three days, Pharaoh will decapitate you and hang you on a tree. And the birds will eat your flesh. And indeed, it happened. Three days later was Pharaoh's birthday. He reevaluated the status of all his servants. He restored the cupbearer to his previous role. He killed the baker just as Joseph had interpreted. It's been pointed out that the reason why the cupbearer was restored to his job, whereas the baker was killed, that may actually be a result of their character. How so? The cupbearer, he had his own dream plus a dream of the interpretation of the baker's dream. The baker actually died. And therefore, what happened the next day? The next day, he was sad. Why was he sad? Because his cellmate, his friend, the baker, was about to die. And therefore, he was sad. And therefore, it shows that he was a righteous person because he was sad with the downfall of other people. Conversely, the baker, he had his dream and the interpretation of the cupbearer's dream. Therefore, he knew that the cupbearer was about to be restored to his post. And the next day, he was sad. Clearly, he was someone who gets sad when other people succeed. And therefore, he was someone of bad character, and therefore it's appropriate that the baker was killed, whereas the cupbearer was restored to his post. 
despite the fact that the cupbearer was indebted to Joseph and Joseph had made a plea that he bring his case to Pharaoh, he did not remember Joseph. Instead, he forgot about him. Even though he had the opportunity now, restored to Pharaoh's good graces, he could have lobbied to save Joseph. He forgot about him. Rashi tells us Joseph made a miscalculation. Joseph relied too heavily on the cupbearer. He should have relied more on God. Maybe he should have told the cupbearer. He should have mentioned to the cupbearer to go bring this agenda item before Pharaoh, but he relied on it too heavily. As a result, he had to suffer and languish in prison for two more years. Joseph began the Parsha. He was a 17-year-old precocious teenager. Maybe he made some poor decisions in how he behaved with respect to his brothers and with, with respect to his father. He ends the Parsha in a very low state. His brothers sold him as a slave. His master's wife falsely accused him of attempted rape. He's now in jail, in prison, with seemingly no hopes of ever getting out.